They want stereotypes? I'll give them one. What is this? Then be dads, rappers, crack, and black, right? Nobody's gonna publish this. I just wanna rub their noses in it. We love it. What? what? It is very, uh... Black? Yes, that's it. I'm happy you said it and not me. <laughs>
uh, in Monk? Why am I, I'm, I wrote about mythology. Why am I not in the section of mythology? And yet there is this cramped view of, of who black people are, who they can be. In this case, it's literature. And so the, lit the publishing world, or at least the bookstore world has decided, well, you're black, Monk is black, no matter what he's writing about, therefore he goes into either black studies or African American culture or whatever they're calling it in the bookstore these days. That, that's right. You're black, and and therefore that is uh, that 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 provides the parameters for who you are, and you can be nothing more uh, uh, than that, nothing outside of that. I think what the issue is is that we in America lack a fluency in race. We and therefore we 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 don't have conversations well around these issues. So we tend to miss the mark, either when we're trying to. Uh, uh, generate progress, or when we're just generally trying to uh, trying to problem solve uh, together, we have discourse that is difficult and fearful and stunted, and therefore we tend very often to be uh, unproductive. But Monk's frustrations begin very early in this film, uh, and it kind of sets up um, uh, um, an understanding of who he is. Uh, but it begins our film with a conversation that's being had across the country, in classrooms across the country. <clears throat> the film starts, he's a professor, he's teaching Flannery O'Connor's book, The Artificial Nigger. That's the name of the book. A uh, Southern gro uh, Gothic writer writing about, yeah, it's, a, it's a, actually not a book, it's a short story, a uh, strange short story. Nonetheless, the, the, that verboten word is on the white wall behind him. A student in the classroom uh, takes offense at this, and the whole conversation blows up. That's a conversation that's being had and it's been had in classrooms across our country and outside of our uh, 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 of the classroom as well. And so we think that this is really timely stuff, which is why the film has, you know, has kind of uh, intrigued audiences. So <clears throat> his frustrations begin early. Um, but actually, I I was doing a uh, I received an award in London recently named after Dillis Powell. Dillis Powell was uh, the, 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 the film critic for the um, uh, London Times. And she, uh, I was wondering if she had written any, in any of her reviews about issues related to our film. I was wondering if she had written about Othello's, uh, about Laurence Olivier's Othello of uh, 1965. Of course, he performed in blackface. She had not. But what I stumbled onto was an article from a few years ago at the University of Michigan, Michigan, where a teacher who was teaching the adaptation of classical literature into opera, uh, a Chinese-born uh, teacher named Bright Sheng, had the apparently incredibly poor judgment to show Olivier's Othello in his class. The classroom erupted. He was forced ultimately to step down from teaching that course. Now I don't know if he understood necessarily the nuances of that uh, of that film and of that tradition, but we could have very much started the film with that scene. And what I found disturbing about it was that you have now, in that instance and in other instances, a younger generation that's afraid to have a conversation around the, the history of race and representation in our country, and you have another segment, older perhaps or not, of our country that wants to be dismissive of this history entirely as though it did not exist. For me, what we need to do is to take in this history uh, so as to understand it, and therefore perhaps understand better who we are and have better discourse and more constructive discourse around these issues and then, wow, perhaps even we can uh, generate some progress around mm -hmm. them. Uh, so, yeah, the, 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 our, our film at, at times is kind of documentary. <laughs> it's, not, it's not so fictional at all. Yeah. Well, 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 right. And on that issue of, you know, uh, the, the, how our culture, particularly our American culture when it comes to race, lacks fluency, gets us to why Monk ends up deciding there in his house, I'm gonna, this is what the people want? 
I'm going to write this book. And it, as we saw in the intro screen, you start writing out my pathology, and then you think, no, my pathology. And then you just cram it with, with, with all these things. And um, after it becomes, and you just do it on a lark and send it to your publisher, basically yeah. a cathartic ex experience, just getting it out of you. Your publisher calls and says uh, they want to buy it, and then it becomes a hit. Um, and then you say at one point, they look at what they publish, look at what they expect us to write. I'm sick of it. And that's an expression of how sick I am when you hand, hand in my pathology. In terms of our culture lacking the fluency to have these conversations on race, how does American fiction engage that conversation? Well, uh, we, we do it uh, fearlessly. That's the first thing. We're not afraid to have these conversations. And as well, we're not afraid to have a laugh while doing it, right. which, uh, which, is, which, is, which provides a, 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 a kind of welcoming atmosphere to anyone really across backgrounds to join us. I think somewhat perhaps, although not entirely in the vein of you know, Mel Brooks and uh, his type of satire, um, it, uh, Mel Brooks uh, spoke at an event recently that I attended, and he said that, you know, satire uh, is is worthless if it's not commenting on the politics uh, uh, and the uh, and the social environment of the times. Um, so, yeah, we're we're doing it in a way we hope that's uh, that's inviting. And while inside of our film are difficult conversations and conversations that don't necessarily go well. At the same time, uh, Cord Jefferson, who wrote and directed uh, this and adapted this from Percival Everett's erasure, uh, Percival as well, and Cord, um, do understand these things and are fluent in the way they observe them and in the way they, uh, they write about them. So we think at least within the two hours of our film, we can maybe have a slightly more elevated, dare I say, slightly smarter uh, kind of take on these issues. And again, you know, why not have a good time while we're doing it? Hey, can I say one more thing about that, um, that, that Othello piece? Sure. As I, as I started to dive down, and this gets back to our, our lacking fluency because we, we, we don't understand the origin or we want to dismiss out of fear or uh, whatever reasons, the origins of of who we are. So, I started to dive down into the uh, the uh, the Othello piece and the and the blackface piece because it does uh, it, it is related to our film in that our film ultimately is not confined to the publishing world, but um, what we're talking about is representation generally whether it be in, 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 in the media or in the real world as we walk down the street. How is it that we are perceived? So I went back, um, as it relates to film, of course, the origins of Black representation are Blackface. Um, Burt Williams, incredible artist, absolute inspiration to me, who made his first full-length full -length film in 1913, a year before Charlie Chaplin made his first uh, short film, but Burt Williams was a black man who performed in blackface. He was absolutely brilliant. If you have an opportunity, it's a silent film called A Natural Born Gambler, 1916. He does a pantomime routine of a poker game that is absolutely delicious. I stole from that when I performed in Top Dog Underdog on Broadway. But looking back to the origins of this thing, and what I came to understand was that there was a guy named T.D. Rice who in the mid 19th century was known as the father or became known as the father of, of, of minstrelsy, a white guy who performed in blackface. And he was the one who really popularized that, uh, that idea or uh, that uh, mode of performance. It had existed before in the culture, but he was the one who really, you know, kind of, uh, made it central to uh, <laughs> the, the theatrical experience, uh, uh, this uh, blackface thing. Do you know where apparently he first saw it? Blackface? Yeah. Or the first blackface performances in America were? They were from uh, British Shakespearean troops doing yeah. Othello. In fact, the only uh, known drawing uh, from 
uh, uh, at, from Shakespeare's time of one of his plays was of Titus Andronicus. And within that is an actor in blackface playing Aaron the Moor. Hmm. So it, 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 it allows us, if we take in the history in this way, to at least find the breadcrumbs along the way as we do the detective work that help us better understand how we got here. So you go from that, from Shakespearean, uh, a Shakespearean uh, drawing of Titus Andronicus, you make your way to mid uh, 19th century America, you make your way to Burt Williams, the beginnings of American cinema, but also the beginnings of black representation. And then you begun to begin to understand how that informed uh, uh, the general understanding of who black people were and how it informed cinematic representations going forward to our film. But if we don't do the dive back into the history, we're completely lost as to understanding how we got here and who we are. It doesn't just apply to film. It mm -hmm. applies generally to an understanding not only of who black people are in this country, but who we are generally as Americans. So it's, I think that's a long winded of saying, uh, <laughs> or explain why we lack fluency. Right. Because listen, we're just like, to be blunt, we don't want to be smart about it. And I think that has to do in some ways with how fearful we are of this stuff for whatever reasons. And again, at least within our film, you don't have to be afraid. You can you can come in, take it in, and you can you know you can laugh at us, you can laugh at yourself, and maybe come at come out it at the end with uh, you know a, at least a fresher take on all of this madness. Well, you know, Jeffrey, we're we're at the point in our culture today where those breadcrumbs you were you were talking about, there are people actively knocking them out of the way, sweeping them out of the way, thinking that you know um, we don't need to see them, we don't need to pay attention to them. But it, there's another part of, of, of fluency that we should talk about. And you, you, started, you started alluding to it when you mentioned Cord, uh, Cord Jefferson, who's also nominated for an Oscar for Best, uh, best Writing Adapted, Adapted Screenplay. Um, and you, the two of you spoke about being intentional that um, American fiction not be a, and I'm quoting, classist, classist dismissing of work that was beneath you, but rather talking about the broadening of representation. Um, and it was this classist dismissing because, you know, if, if white audiences or the publishing world in the case of, of American fiction, if they're, all they respond to is not Monk's mythology um, book that he wrote, but they're responding to all of the pathology and, and my pathology, how, do, how were you able to be intentional to ensure that by doing that satire in my pathology, you're not you're not dismissing um, uh, the lives of people for whom some of those things are true. Yes, yeah, sure, uh, absolutely. I I think we did a couple of things. One was that we um, we we insisted that Monk, and he is in the book as well, be flawed. He's not necessarily the most reliable narrator. He goes through a process of self-reflection. He goes through a process of being checked, particularly by the women in his life. He <laughs> goes, he's not the same man at the end of the movie that he is uh, at the beginning. He's, uh, he's considered his flaws. He's considered perhaps some of the blind spots in his perspective. He's considered... Um, uh, you know, his own uh, personal damage, and he's changed. I think that's optimistic. He's changed personally, and he's changed in terms of his understanding that um, perhaps there is space for all of these stories. I think our argument, too, is we're not saying these stories should not exist, but there's just a broader range of story to be told. Right. So that's one way in which we do we we do this there's also something that uh, interesting that happens in that scene that you describe in which he you know out of outrage decides to write my pathology he's writing in this mode that he you know 
is make is is making uh, is mocking, you know, that he considers dismissive. But at the same time, what he's writing about is a son confronting his father out of frustration, out of disappointment, out of confusion, out of anger. And there's some subtext within that that relates to his own experience with his father, his father having died by his own hand uh, seven years before the beginning of the film. So even as he's, you know, you know, uh, being uh, being disrespectful to this genre of literature, at the same time he's infused, at least uh, within that scene that we show in the film, something of his own broken interiority, to use his own phrase. And so um, even in the act of, of trying to be dismissive, he actually is admitting that there is some value there, at least personally for him. So we hope that, you know, um, we're nuanced in this and that certainly we're, we're not spouting the gospel ourselves that there's room for interpretation within our storytelling um, and there's room for everyone. And I, I think, again, going back to having a good time with this, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We're kind of, as I said once before to you, we're throwing darts at everyone in the room, including ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that was a very important uh, approach for us. You know, as you were giving that answer, uh, you know, I was going back and, and thinking, you, you're talking about representation and it's interesting because you know I'm watching I'm watching the movie, and you know and I'm watching Monk, and Monk reminds me so much of me right down to the way Monk dresses, mm. and there's Monk in a Martha's Vineyard Sag Harbor like environment, and mm -hmm. all of the sort of class and everything things that, that that represents while writing while writing my pathology and it seems to me and you know correct me if i'm wrong but just by having monk be in in that environment is also inviting the viewer to to realize you know you know black people go to the beach black people have have beach homes and have this community of other black people who also have have beach homes a a, a view of black life that we don't usually get to see in film. That's that's right. Of course, you know. Aside from the fact, of course, Jonathan, that you know, I uh, I shaped the character based on you. Uh, <laughs> you're, 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 you're you're absolutely right. But this was this is as well why we we wanted to make sure that it, this wasn't solely a celebration of the black bourgeoisie. Didn't want that at all. But we 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 do that too because yes, as you say, these are black folks. You know, just doing the things that they want to do and they have access to. Uh, but at the same time, they're by no means perfect. Uh, right. this, this family that we see is as crazy as anyone else's family, it is as flawed, <laughs> is as beautiful, is as loving, uh, dysfunctional at times, and inescapable. We wanted to make sure that we fleshed uh, these people out in a fully human way. Um, uh, but um, but I think what's most um, uh, most important in that regard in fleshing out their humanness is to show that, you know, they're far from perfect. Um, but mm -hmm. for me, that aspect of the film, that family dynamic, the story of this man and his relationship to love, his relationship to love of himself, love of the other, love of family, his caretaking of his mother. That's the, that's the heart. That's the spirit. Uh, that's really the body as well of our movie. And it is, while we don't try to convey an answer necessarily to these thorny questions, it is in some ways an answer to the absurdity of the social, of the satirical side of the movie, the, the tropes and the stereotypes and the kind of weird tragedy I describe of that side of the film, even though it's satirical. Mm -hmm. The answer to all of that is this family that we rarely see in cinema. We rarely see, as you described, people such as myself, Sterling K. Brown, Tracy Ellis Ross, Leslie Uggams, portraying a family like this. And, uh, and, and, 
when I saw the film for the first time with an audience, I looked up at one point and I just said to myself, wow, what beautiful people. And uh, so if there is an answer there, and maybe there are several more answers there, but if there, if there is, then that, that's certainly one of them. That mm -hmm. just, let's just see, let's just see the full humanness of, of, of who we are. And mm -hmm. let's celebrate. And we've got about five minutes left. You mentioned Sterling K. Brown. He was nominated for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, and his, his character yes. is, a, is a riot. So let me get you, try to get you on two things in the five minutes that we have left. You've played several real-life um, figures throughout your career. Jean-Michel Basquiat, Colin Powell, Martin Luther King, Muddy Waters, and most recently, Adam Clayton Powell in the movie Rustin. And Jeremy, I have to tell you, I did Jeffrey, not, you- Jeffrey, you, Jonathan. J yeah? Oh, you said Jeremy, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's right. Je right. Jeffrey, you were so, so good. And and dis basically, dis I did not realize it was you until the credits. No, you that was Jeremy. <laughs> Stop messing with me. <laughs> Um, how difficult is it to to um, play such well known um, well known figures, both um, in American history, American culture, but particularly um, in Black history and Black culture? You mean Adam Clayton Powell? Uh, uh, all of them: Jean Michel Basquiat, Colin Powell, Martin Luther King. These are huge figures in in history. Well. Yeah, there's a there's a, a greater level of responsibility uh, to those characters because uh, these are yeah real lives, and I do try to the extent that I can uh, to to do you know their memories justice. So I, yeah, I take a little extra care uh, with that. Obviously, uh, I try to choose people that I I'm very interested in that I have a good deal of respect for. Um, and ultimately, what I find when I work on, particularly on Jean, with you know the story of Jean-Michel Basquiat or Muddy Waters or any of these people, really, I find a love for them, and it's out of that you know sense of respect and appreciation for them that I'm able to kind of dig deeper into the tales of who they are, and uh, and in the ideal, uh, bring those to bear when I when I tell their stories. Um, yeah, yeah, there's so many wonderful, wonderful characters <clears throat> in our history. Uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat was not very well known before that film came out to the world outside of the art world. So yeah, I took good care in, in kind of introducing some part of his story uh, to, to people who hadn't previously known of him. But there are so many more characters back in our history who's, who, you know, who haven't had that light shined on them, who have incredible stories waiting to be told. So, um, uh, you know, it's it's just rich with with um, uh, with 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 story there, and I'm hoping uh, maybe if uh, people have appreciated that that I've worked in that way, maybe there are other actors out there who will work in that way and go back and find even more of these uh, these wonderful men and women and bring their bring their stories to light as well. In previous interviews, you've said that Basquiat and and American Fiction are films that bookend your career. Um, in the, the, I'm looking at the clock. We've got just a minute left. And so I can't have this conversation with you, Jeffrey, <laughs> without asking you, what does it mean to be, um, to receive an Oscar nomination for your role in American fiction? Um, it, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, I've, uh, I've been really moved uh, because this is, this is recognition from my peers, uh, not only for my work, but for Sterling's work and for the entire film, film, which is cool too, because that, that represents everyone who worked on this movie. But in that this comes from our peers and they've looked at what we've done and said, yeah, we, we like that. And we like the work that you've done for a long time. Uh, yeah, it's really gratifying. And uh, I'm super, super appreciative, yeah. This has been great. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this. Jeffrey Wright is um, a Washington, you know, Washington native. You went to St. Albans, right? I did. 
Yeah, yeah went to St. Go. Albans, play played lacrosse. So the Washington Post is your is your hometown newspaper. So I am doubly thrilled uh, to welcome you to Washington Post Live, Jeffrey Wright. Oscar-nominated so lead actor in the Oscar-nominated Best Picture American Fiction. Thank you so much for coming to Capehart on Washington Post Live. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. Southeast D.C. represent. <laughs> All right. And thank you for joining us. For more of these important conversations, sign up for a Washington Post subscription. Get a free trial by visiting wapo.st slash live. Again, W-A-P-O dot S-T slash live. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, associate editor at The Washington Post. Thanks for watching Capehart on Washington Post Live.